started our Who Do We Say We Are series, I was given the opportunity to speak about spiritual leadership today. So who do we say we are when we talk about spiritual leadership and having a new ministry? Well, I decided I didn't want to rely on my old thoughts and habits, so I put out to the universe to please help me understand what spiritual leadership <coughs> would look like, taste like, feel like. You know that old story? You ought to be careful what you ask for. <laughs> <laughs> because just three weeks ago, I followed in the footsteps of Alice Whiting, and I found myself in a holding cell in the Wake County Jail. <laughs> it was Moral Monday. and we had been brought in. And you know those white plastic ties you see people use? Yeah. They are as nasty as they look. Because <laughs> I'll be honest with you, within three hours my arms had started to, oh my gosh, they had given out on me. I was hoping they'd just go numb. It would feel better. <laughs> my shoulders were aching. My neck was sore. And when they finally cut that sucker off, my arms fell in front of me, and for a while they just hung there. I could not move. I don't care that the woman behind me who was a guard saying, Lady, you need to put your hands on the wall. I said, I will as soon as they will rise, lady. I am sorry. <laughs> as soon as I get feeling back, I will be glad to oblige. And as soon as I was frisked, I was put into a holding cell with 12 other women. And I will tell you in that moment, I have to be really honest. I was in pain and I was hurting. And all I could think of to do was to say, could we at least rub each other's shoulders? <laughs> and so we got in a circle. <laughs> said, we need to do some yoga. <laughs> Another voice said, let's do downward facing that's been arrested put before us. 
that wasn't there for civil disobedience. Let's clean up the energy of the domain. And as we sat there in our downward dog position, we released the energy, we cleaned it up, and we sent it to Mother Earth. And when we stood, all 12 of us walked on and on. We started sharing our own stories. And quite honestly, when the guards came and opened the doors to put us in chain gang style to take us down to the magistrate's office, quite honestly, one of the women said, we're not through. <laughs> spiritual leadership actually looks like. Spiritual leadership in that moment meant that we were going to minister to the needs in the moment. That we were going to minister to the needs in the moment. My need in that moment was physical relief. But that was the need for everyone in that moment. What we did for spiritual leadership, Chris. What we did for spiritual leadership, that not only did we minister to the need in the moment, but we were open to the inspiration of everyone there. Everyone there had a voice. And one after another, you know, let's well, rub shoulders, let's turn around, let's do yoga, let's pick up this energy, one after the other after the other. There was a minister in the group that we knew about, and she had one part in that, but only one part. But we were open to the inspiration of whoever was speaking, whoever had the next highest vibration in that moment was the one that spoke. And then in that holding cell, we started embracing our oneness. We were all women, we were old, we were young, we were tall, we were short, we were skinny, we were fat, we were mothers, we were single, we were grandmothers, we were black, we were white, we were Hispanic, we were gay, and we were straight. And in that moment, in that holding cell in the jail in Wake County, we were one. And in that moment, we were one. When they let us out into the night air, I knew that I had learned a lesson and knew that it was powerful, that in that moment I had understood what ministering in the moment felt like, what opening to everyone's suggestions felt like, and what embracing each other felt like in our oneness. But I don't know about you, that wasn't the spiritual leadership I grew up with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and in the weeks since that experience and that holding cell down in Raleigh and preparing for this message, I realized that I was holding on to some old spiritual leadership and some old spiritual knowledge. I was only in my mid-twenties. My father was the Sunday school superintendent at my home church. And my dad came to me and he said, Pat, would you help me design some new programs for the church? I'd really like to do something fun. And I said, no problem. You know, I was a newly minted master's degree person. I'd just gotten my master's. And I was a minister of youth and education at another church in the county. That's what I did, so it wasn't a stretch for me. So I said, okay, let's see what you might need, man. And so I developed three programs for him. Children's worship service, teacher education, training, and a new church library. Wrote it all up, typed it up, and he said, okay, we've got to go take it to the deacons at the next deacons meeting. And they'll have to approve it. No problem. And he said, no, you've got to go with me, because if they ask me anything, I won't know what to say. So I went with my dad to the deacons meeting that night in my, my little hometown Baptist church. And the deacons were meeting in this little classroom. And when we walked in, they 
greeted us all, took my dad, and walked him into the classroom. And then the head of the deacons brought out a chair and set it in the hall and asked me would I sit there and if they needed me, they could open the door and talk to me. You know why. Women weren't allowed to be deacons. Women weren't allowed to be in spiritual leadership. And they thought it odd that they could talk about my ideas, but not with me. <laughs> and I remember sitting in that hall, justifying my being there, well, it's for the church, it's for Dan. You know, being a little critical that how dare they sit me in the hall, don't they know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> Minister of Youth and Education at a bigger church than this, honey. <laughs> I remember sitting there, and what I didn't remember is that I have carried the pain of that unworthiness all of my life. I have carried the pain of not being worthy enough to discuss my own ideas with the deacon board of my own church. And you know, it's shown up in a lot of ways. You know, you go and you try to go into a new relationship and all of a sudden you think it's what you can give them, not who you are. And if they say, I love you, you don't really mean it. Because all those men had hugged me and told me that they loved me. Mm. And they still set me in the hall. Mm. They didn't look like a lot to me. Mm. But I began to understand how when we start talking about spiritual leadership for unity in Greensburg, <laughs> maybe I'm the only one that's got some old wounds and some old healing that needs to be done. But in my childhood growing up, not only were women considered unworthy to be in any leadership position, but on top of that, I was told I was born a sinner. That I was a wretched wreck. Now, I thought that was double whammy. You got me once on a woman, and now I'm a sinner. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> original sin. And you know what else my church taught me? Was that God punishes. That God was a punishing God, a severe God. And as a child, I always wondered about that. You know, we'd read in the Old Testament how the, the children of Israel would go into the Canaanites and the Moabites and the Jippy Whites and the Kumi Whites. You know those people. <laughs> those names you could never pronounce and the ministers couldn't either. <laughs> say that God commanded them to kill every man, every woman, every beast, every ox, every duck, every goose, every dog, and every cat. And I'd sit there as a child and say, well, what did the dogs and cats do? Why did they get the cattle? What did they do? But it was a punishing God. Has that thought of punishment changed in your life? I was talking to someone not recently. Uh, I was talking to someone recently. <laughs> I heard that myself. <laughs> I was talking to someone recently, and they said to me, after they talked about this little medical problem, this little dis-ease they were having, and they looked me in the eye and they say, and they said, do you think God's punishing me? Do you think God is punishing me for this illness? Of course, as fast as I could, I tried to talk to her about there's no such thing as a punishing God. But to this day, this woman is carrying the idea that God punishes us, that there is a God to punish. And I don't know about you, but I grew up with the idea that, that somebody outside of me knew more than I did. That there was always a spiritual authority and it didn't look like me, it didn't act like me, and it wasn't me. That there was a minister of the church who knew all, told all, and was all. That there were priests, there were nuns, there are popes, and that God somehow comes through other people, but not through me. 
that I was to listen to what I was told. And I had one friend tell me that a nun told her that you don't need to read the Bible. If there's something you need to know, the Father will tell you. The priest will tell you. That somebody else, somebody else knew more than I did. You know, growing up, church had to look a certain way. Well, there are people I know that don't feel that you can, it's not church <coughs> if we're not in stained glass and steeples, if there's not clerical robes, rituals, and pipe organs, that church has to look a certain way. Well, I realized for me that if I was going to deliver a message this Sunday on spiritual leadership, I had to heal my past. I had to heal what was coloring and limiting me from understanding spiritual leadership. So I took the occasion to go over to Ellie McFall's house. And there we started looking at my sitting in the hall. And I asked Ellie, would she come this afternoon and be for us an opportunity that we could all sit together if we choose to. If anybody has any old wounds you might have. So that we could allow those to be transmuted. Because those old beliefs color and limit our experiences today. And Ellie's going to join us. We're going to get our food and we're going to go straight to the CLC. And I've already, Abraham has already told us that we could come right to the one o'clock. <laughs> it's not a problem. We can do it all today. Because of what I found out when I was doing my healing work around this, that I had gotten angry at a bunch of deacons for sitting me in a hall. And what I was really angry at was that I sat in that hall. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. That my energy, my willingness to sit in that hall allowed those men to sit behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. My willingness, my willingness to sit in and I took back my power. I'm not sitting in hallways anymore. Figuratively or emotionally, thank you very much. I'm not accepting. I'm not accepting the unworthiness of old spiritual leadership. I'm not accepting the punishment of old spiritual leadership. And I'm not accepting that somebody else might have more God than I have or that you have. Because here's the deal. <laughs> I've come to believe we don't have to fight anything. And I'm just going to say this and I know I should. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. But if every woman that's in church this morning would not be in the play, would not sit in the halls and call themselves unworthy. If every man, every child would sit in service this morning and say, I am no longer going to be unworthy, and they walked out of the churches that treated them that way, by the end of the year, 75% of the churches would be locked and shuttered. Mm -hmm. All right. say we are, we could not sit in places where we are made to feel less than. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I'm no longer sitting in hallways. Woo! In my church, at my work, in my family, or in my relationship. Because why? We've got new wine. We have new wine. And what does that new line, wine look like? You see, our new wine is that we have, we know that there is one presence and there is one power in this universe. And that is good. The new wine is that there's one presence and there's one power. We can't put that new wine in the old bottle of hell, fire, damnation, and punishment. We can't be holding the bottle of punishment the devil and hell, and put in the new wine. It won't work. 
The new wine cannot go into the old bottle of punishment. We have new wine. We understand that we are divine beings born into original blessing. This new wine does not fit into the old bottle that we are sinners by birth and that we were born into original sin. We can't hold that concept, either consciously or unconsciously, and hog the new wine. It will not go. We have new wine that we know that our thoughts are our creative power. And whatever we focus our thoughts upon, it will manifest in our lives. The old model is that we see ourselves as helpless and unworthy. The new wine is that prayer and meditation are our direct link to the vine. Prayer and meditation takes us directly to source. The old model is that someone else is standing before us in spirit. Someone else tells us what to think and feel and believe. New wine, old bottle. Our new wine is that we walk our talk. We walk our talk. The old bottle, the old bottle is that we just hire a minister to do all our spiritual work for us. New wine is that we walk our talk, knowing our power, being the divine beings, creating, manifesting, connecting with source, and we walk it. Old bottle, we just hire a minister and they do all the work for us. Because here's what I know about spiritual leadership now, after sitting in a holding cell in Raleigh, North Carolina, is that we will attract who we are. What we are holding inside of us is what we will attract in new spiritual leadership into this church. The spiritual principle is simple. As within, so without. If we're holding on to the old bottles of our childhood faith, of our childhood beliefs, we will recreate that same kind of ministerial leadership. I don't know about you, but I believe that unity in Greensboro is beyond that. I believe that unity in Greensboro understands that we have new wine to drink and that we're willing to heal the old wounds from our past. And that we're willing not to let those old wounds color and limit our experiences. In that holding cell, everyone was a spiritual leader. You see, we understand that we are Spirit, that we are spirit. And we just don't do spiritual leadership in church. We don't just come here and be spiritual. Our spiritual leadership is at our work. It's in our homes. It's in our families. It's with our relationship. And it's even in holding cells and jails. That's where we do our spiritual work. So here's the deal. When I asked the universe to show me what does spiritual leadership look like for unity in Greensboro, I saw a group of people that was willing to minister to each other in the moment. I saw a group of people who were open to the inspiration of everyone. And I saw a group of people who were willing to embrace us. And if we're willing to hold that, we will attract to us spiritual leadership that will blow the socks off this community. Do you hear that? It doesn't matter. Oh, it, it, it matters, of course, that we have qualifications and a job description, that we say what the characteristics of our new minister might look like. That's important. But the truth of it is, what is important in bringing in you to minister to this church is how we're holding ministry and leadership within us. 
Because it will, we will never attract who we are not. But I've seen unity in Christ as a powerful spiritual community who's willing to minister in the moment, open absolutely to the inspiration of ourselves and others. And I've seen unity in Christ absolutely willing to embrace our lives. And for this, I am truly grateful. Get ready, my folks. We're going to do our healing. And when we bring in a new Thank <laughs> <laughs> you.